I'm Dom Nichols, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we will report on how the EU has said it will send billions of euros in aid to Ukraine, regardless of US commitment. And we hear from a Ukrainian journalist about her hometown of Odessa. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. The first duty of my government is security and defence, to make clear our unshakable support of NATO and with our allies towards Ukraine. Keep stand strong. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Tuesday, the 17th of September, two years and 211 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by senior foreign correspondent Roland Oliphant and Ukrainian journalist Victoria Kiyose. I started with the latest battlefield updates from Ukraine and Russia. Not much movement up and down the line, mainly incremental Russian advances in the Donbass, although there are some areas of Ukrainian forces gaining small bits of ground in the Donbass. Up north, Ukrainian forces have advanced in Volchansk, that lodgment of uh, Russian forces that's been northeast of, of Kharkiv for some, some weeks now, not done anything else. Russian forces are no further forward towards Pokrov, a little bit of land exchanged from both sides, even though Kiev says that Russian forces attacked the city 40 times yesterday. The Ukrainian Air Force says that overnight it shot down 34 of 51 Russian drones. Then into Russia and Kursk, Russian forces said to have made small gains as they try to push that main Ukrainian force back east towards Suja, that area, and also deal with that second incursion on the southern flank, the border with Ukraine that we spoke about yesterday, but next to no movement there either. Now, just broadly, away from the actual sort of tactical updates, but there's been some development in in numbers and personnel and equipment and all the rest of it, which is worth digging into. There's a few reports today which we can try and get our head around. So firstly, President Zelensky said in an interview with CNN last Friday, he said Ukraine needs 14 brigades to be ready for an unspecified requirement. Uh, And he said that Ukraine has not been able to equip even four of these brigades with slowly arriving Western aid. So he was focusing on the the equipment, really. Then yesterday, the Financial Times reported comments from Ukraine's Parliamentary Defence Committee chairperson, Oleksandr Zavitnevich, who said that Ukrainian mobilisation is on track and that newly trained forces could impact, in his words, the battlefield in three months. So that was sort of a comment about the, the numbers of personnel. And then you may remember Ukraine's ground forces commander, Lieutenant General Alexander Pavlyuk, said four months ago that Ukraine was working to stand up 10 new brigades, but that equipment, not manpower, was the main problem. So he's kind of echoing, or, or President Zelensky's comments, it sort of echoes uh, General Pavlyuk's. So between the kind of equipment and personnel, not really sure on the detail. There's probably a very good reason for that. But messages from Ukraine that they are not exactly where they want to be in terms of personnel or equipment, which all, of course, could be Maskarovska. Now then, yesterday, on the sort of related theme, Putin signed a decree saying that Russian armed forces should be raised to one and a half million service personnel. And that decree he signed yesterday would be an increase of 180,000 personnel from the last one that was signed in December 2023. That had set an increase of 170,000 compared with August 2022. All in all, it means that Putin has told the military to expand by around 350,000 personnel since the start of the full-scale invasion. Nothing says that your lightning three-day offensive is going brilliantly than having to expand your military by 350,000 people. Anyway, a lot of this reporting comes from the Institute for the Study of War. They say that this latest decree is not an indicator of a new wave of Russian mobilisation, but it does indicate the pressure Russia is, is under in terms of personnel, which we've reported on numerous times but without hard numbers to, to pin it against. Now, connected to that, Ukrainian uh, military intelligence agency, the HUR, said earlier today that Russia is having to use personnel from Syria in their military service, particularly for the fighting in the Donbass. Uh, They say Syrian nationals are promised Russian passports for their service 
if they survive, I guess. Now, the HUR said in a statement on social media, Russia has established a scheme with travel companies to recruit Syrians for the war against Ukraine. First, poor people are offered jobs as security guards in Russian oil regions, and then they are lured with a higher salary to fight the war in Ukraine. Now, we know that a lot of well, so the oil and gas companies have their own sort of quasi-private paramilitary forces, I suppose you'd say, armed guards elsewhere. And then it's from those, there have been many reports that they are then encouraged slash pressed into, into military service. Now, the HUR, with this, uh, this news this morning, they put up the stories of, uh, of two people, Mohammed Mansour and Wahid Mercy El Shibli, two Syrian mercenaries, they say, fighting for Russia. Um, I won't go into all the details, but have a look at the Kiev Independent for the for the wider story about the details of how they're recruited and all the rest of it, the enticements. And although, as a Kiev Indy says, they can't verify the claims, suffice to say, it doesn't end well for Mohammed um, Wahid. Now then, we know other countries, some countries have taken steps to prevent their citizens who may be travelling to work in Russia being drafted into military service. India, for example, we know has reached a deal with Moscow to discharge any Indian national serving in the Russian armed forces, and Nepal has stopped issuing work permits to Russia. And just finally on this, today's British Ministry of Defence update says Russia has likely suffered over 610,000 casualties, which they say is uh, killed in action and wounded in action. Traditionally, the Brits would say casualties also includes um, missing and taken prisoner, but I think as they are such a small percentage, it's just easier to use the, just the, the easy monikers of killed and wounded. But British MOD Defence Intelligence say, uh, quote, tactics based on mass infantry waves has required Russia to continuously replenish frontline forces with a constant stream of new recruits. Now, they say it's likely recruitment this year has decreased compared to last year. And although Russian MOD said late last year that they were recruiting 1,600 people a day, there were publicly cited figures that put that closer to 1,000 daily. British MOD saying today that that figure is probably inflated and there's been widespread reporting that they are losing, Russia is losing about that same amount, you know, over a thousand each day, which would be one reason for the very slow advance up and down the line, but particularly, um, you know, in Pacross and surely must be a worry for them as they've had to leave their flank, Russia's flank with beastly NATO up in Norway, um, utterly undefended expansionist NATO, if we are to believe the uh, the guff the Kremlin comes out with, which for anyone who doesn't have porridge between their ears, we don't. Anyway, Roland, you've been looking at some political and diplomatic updates, quite a bit coming out of the EU today. Let's start in Brussels. What can you tell us? Yeah, that's right. And this actually comes from the FT today, who are reporting that Europe is is looking to lend billions to the Ukraine, regardless of US backing. Now, the the point here is, if, if you've been following this story, and if you were listening to us back in June, you would have heard us report on this. Back in June, the G7, uh, G7 leaders agreed to a plan to loan money to Ukraine. It was going to be about $50 billion, split roughly 50-50 between the US and Europe. And the idea was the collateral on that was going to be about $260 billion of frozen Russian assets. And it was the interest from those assets that was going to pay off the loan. At the time, that seemed like a lot of progress. It wasn't as much as Ukraine wanted. Ukraine has been, um, several of its allies in, in Europe have been calling for just just confiscate the Russian assets and just use that. But it was regarded as progress. That's hit the buffers a bit. Um, And the reason it's hit the buffers is because the Americans said, okay, if you want us to sign up to this, we need some kind of guarantee that those frozen assets are going to remain frozen so that we know there'll be a steady interest stream coming off that to recoup the loan. The Europeans said, okay, what we'll do is we'll extend its freeze from a six-month rolling freeze to a 36-month one. And that's been blocked by Hungary. Hungary were arguing that no decision should be made until after the US election on that. And the effect of that has, has basically been to, as far as we're aware, we understand it's still the, the plan A, but has, has basically been to, to put the brakes um, on that plan. So the alternative plan is it will be uh, the EU alone. It will not involve the United States. It will be a plan that requires a majority of approval, uh, but not unanimity. That means the Hungarians won't be able to block it. And we understand we're looking at a loan of somewhere between 20 and 40 billion euros. Now, 
Ukraine, as we understand, has has a, a pretty big. I think we're talking about something like a thirty eight billion dollar funding shortfall um, this year. This 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 money would be to keep the country running. Basically, this is this is absolutely critical. And 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 the messaging here is that they want to get this done before the end of the year because, to quote a, a little-known television show, winter is coming and there, there is an awful lot of anxiety in the European Union, in Ukraine, about how to get the country through what is anticipated to be an extremely difficult winter financially and, and, and just physically given the, um, the degradation of Ukraine's energy infrastructure over the past several months. I'm just going to add something on that, actually. The German foreign minister... Annalena Baerbock has has just announced today that Germany is going to be extending separately to this, extending uh, an additional 100 million euros to Ukraine this winter. She said, look, Russia is planning, uh, here's the quote, a winter war with the aim of making the lives of people in Ukraine as terrible as possible. So this is all part of the international diplomatic effort, financial effort to prepare Ukraine to get it through through this winter. And, and remember, just to give you a sense of how focused people are on this, when when David Lammy, uh, the British Foreign Secretary, was out in Kiev last week with Anthony Blinken, David Lammy's message to, uh, you know, he, he told the Telegraph, look, what we're talking about is the next several months, kind of next four, five, six months. So really the focus was on getting through winter. Winter is the the big thing. Staying in Brussels, news out of Brussels just today is that Ursula von der Leyen has uh, finally finalised the lineup for the European Commission. She won a second five-year term back in June. There's been months of horse trading. This could be a very, uh, <laughs> a very, a very Joe Barnesish, um, uh, Brusselly European story. But there's a few things to pick out. Uh, I think the significant thing is that a number of prominent roles have gone to quite hawkish Russia critics, which I suppose you could translate as quite quite robust um, defenders of Ukraine. Um, the ones to pick out, particularly uh, Kaya Kalas, former Prime Minister of Estonia. Sure, she's already been uh, put in as foreign policy chief. And interestingly, in the new defence brief, so there's going to be a commissioner for defence. It's the first time. It's a direct response to the security crisis triggered by the war in Ukraine. That goes to Andreas Kubilius, former Lithuanian Prime Minister. Again, very robust, very hawkish line on support to Ukraine and, and criticism of Russia. The slightly unpredictable thing was that the uh, the European Commissioner for Enlargement and Recovery of Ukraine, basically there was a European Commissioner for Enlargement, and that portfolio is now lumped in with Recovery for Ukraine. That's going to go to a Slovenian diplomat called Marta Kos. That's a slight surprise because it had been tipped to go to uh, Valdis Dombrovkis, uh, another Latvian. Ukrainska Pravda reports that part of the thinking is that, look, there were just too many too many Baltic states, uh, diplomats and politicians already occupying key parts of uh, the foreign policy brief. So it went to a Slovenian. However, What's what's the, I don't know what the what the what the European Union equivalent of Kremlinology is the Brusselsology, um, perhaps if you're doing the Brusselsology, you would know that she replaces a Hungarian diplomat who previously held that role. You know, analysts have been saying, well, you know, if 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 it goes somewhere else, that could be an indication given the Hungarian government's position on the Ukrainian war. It it could it'll probably be seen in Kiev as as welcome news, and possibly it might signal grounds for optimism for Ukraine regarding ascension talks and an eventual membership of the European Union. Cracking on, I just want to go back to um, to Chisinau, the capital of Moldova, for a second where Annalena Baerbock was speaking. The reason for that is, is that, so she was, she's in, she's in uh, Chisinau attending this conference about uh, local security along with, um, it's the Germans, it's the Romanians, um, the French, uh, the Moldovans. And she's basically said quite bluntly, if Ukraine falls, then Moldova is next. Here's the quote. Everything we do to support Ukraine also means fostering stabilization with regards to Moldova. It is clear what the greatest concern of the people here is that if Ukraine falls, Moldova is the next country in line. Moldovan President Maya Sandu also speaking at the same event. A line from her, Russia's war against Ukraine, which we condemned from the very first day, has caused enormous damage to our economy. The uncertainty caused by the war continues to seriously hinder our economic development and will continue to hinder it as long as the war lasts. Quite dry words, but look, the context of this is that Moldova is going to have presidential elections on October the 24th, six weeks away, maybe less than that now. And Western governments have been accusing Russia of getting ready to interfere with those elections for uh, for months. I mean, back back in June, there was a joint statement by Canada, the UK, and the US 
accusing Russia of trying to, you know, undermine the election by backing opposition candidates, by by spreading fake news and uh, and propaganda. We had the Ukrainians last year saying they'd uncovered a kind of a Russian plot to replace Masandu. And if you look at any any kind of report, any kind of study of recent Russian covert operations, regime change, all that kind of thing, a lot of it uh, talks about Moldova. When you're speaking to, to the kind of people who follow or know about, you know, this kind of stuff. I was at a briefing with... Um, Back at Rusi, I think it was I think it was Jack Watling and some of the other chaps at Rusi did a really interesting piece about Russia's GRU led covert sabotage and, and disruption campaigns and, and they kept on talking about Moldova as a really a place of great interest to the Kremlin and, and, and a potentially vulnerable place for the West, for the context. For those who don't know, Moldova is a former Soviet Republic. It does have a large number of Russian speakers. It's right there between Romania and Ukraine, quite a strategic location. Um, it's got all of those factors that the Russians have used in the past to foment unrest. So uh, that's that context. Um, a little bit more so Meta, the owner of Facebook, um, says it's banning RT, uh, formerly Russia Today, the Russian state-backed cable news channel. Uh, Rossiya Savodnya, that's the state's media holding company, I think, in which uh, basically an organization, a company that includes RT, but also includes Rian Ovesti and, and other outfits. They were being banned from Meta's platforms, saying that the outlets had used deceptive tactics to carry out covert influence operations online. Now, this comes shortly after the United States filed some money laundering charges against um, two RT employees uh, for what officials said was a scheme to hire an American company to produce online content to influence the 2024 election. Uh, And remember on Friday, just a few days ago, Anthony Blinken said that uh, you should basically treat RT the same way as you you treat a covert intelligence um, operation. The Russians obviously are not very happy at all. Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesperson, says that Meta is discrediting itself with these actions. Such selective actions against Russian media are unacceptable. This complicates prospects for normalizing our relationship with Meta. I mean, on that relationship, Dom, I mean, Russia's already banned Instagram and Facebook. Um, so there's already a, a strained relationship between Russia um, and Meta. WhatsApp, however, is not banned. Millions of people in Russia use WhatsApp. So there is a bit of um, a bit of exposure there. For the context, of course, um, this comes weeks after the arrest of Pavel Durov, the founder of Telegram Messenger in France last month. So all within the context of the tech war, the, the you know, the propaganda war, the, um, uh, the question of, of, of influence operations and all of that. One last thing. Well, no, two last things, Dom. Sorry. I'm sorry I'm going on, but there's a lot to cover. I think we should mark the MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. They've closed their operations in Russia after 32 years. They say they got a letter from the Russian Justice Ministry saying it had been removed from a, a register of foreign NGOs um, allowed to work. It was actually the Dutch affiliate which ran the operations there that has been stripped of accreditation. There's still going to be an MSF representative office in Moscow, but that's the end of the operations. They've been doing a lot in Russia um, since 92. They've provided aid for the homeless. Uh, they've done a lot of TB and HIV treatment, which has long been, you know, a real headache in um, across the former Soviet Union, actually, um, not just in Russia. Um, also, also Bishkek in Ukraine, especially in prisons. MSF, apparently, they say they provided aid to more than 52,000 people displaced by the war into Russia. They say they're very sad to leave, but they, they hope they will be back. My last diplomatic update is actually probably the most important, Dom, and I apologise for droning on at you, but people tune in to, to hear the news, and I'm sorry, but there's a lot. Here's the thing that caught my eye, really, today. So last night, uh, Vladimir Zelensky, on his kind of nightly video address, he said his victory plan for Ukraine is now 90% complete. Now, uh, what does that mean? Now, the victory plan, we don't know what it is. It, it, it is separate from the 10-point peace roadmap that he unveiled uh, earlier in the war. As far as we understand, well, <laughs> we don't know what's in it, but 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 we know we think it's it, it's meant to convince allies there is a strategy, a credible plan for getting to an end to the war, to victory and to peace. We know Mr. Zelensky is going to go to Washington to see Joe Biden before the end of the month, probably next week. He has said he's going to present this to Joe Biden. He's going to present it to Kamala Harris. He's going to present it to Donald Trump. Um, so the current president and and whoever is going to be the next president, he's going to sit down and say, look, this is the plan. We do not know what's in it at all. I mean, Bild, the German tabloid, reported just before the weekend that one of the proposals is, okay, we'll freeze the conflict, we'll have a ceasefire on certain sections of the line, 
perhaps as a quid pro quo for persuading the Americans to give the permission for those deep strike in Russia with Western missiles. Um, that was vigorously denied, explicitly denied by uh, Mr. Zelensky's administration over the weekend. But we do know also that it's, it's, it does look like he's going to be asking for stuff. I mean, when he announced this a few weeks ago, he said that its success is going to depend on whether or not Joe Biden is prepared to give him uh, what's in the plan. And he also said it may sound too ambitious for some, but it's an important plan for us. So whatever is in it, it's important. We can expect it to be presented to Joe Biden when Mr. Zelensky goes to America. I think probably, what's the date? The 17th, isn't it? The United Nations General Assembly annual jamboree of world leaders is um, 22nd to 23rd so next week in New York I imagine he'll be attending that that looks like the date we know that there's talk about that being the date for a possible green light for this deep strike permission the Ukrainians have been seeking so that for me is the kind of date for your diary if you're looking forward for a diplomatic political uh, way marker that's the next thing um, I'm looking at Dom and listeners, thank you for your patience listening to me talk um, for so incredibly long. Not at all, Roland. Not at all. Always a pleasure. Uh, now, great pleasure to invite a new friend, new friend to the telly, new friend to the pod, Victoria Kiyose, a Ukrainian journalist over here for, for a little while. We've been chatting the last couple of days. Victoria, thank you so much for, for coming on. I'm sorry if we sort of suddenly parachuted you into, into this, but I thought it'd be really interesting to hear a little bit about your hometown, Odessa. In particular, I mean, it's been right on the front line of all, of, especially the long-range strikes from caliber missiles and God knows what else. But I'd be really keen to hear your the first-person view of how, how your city has responded. What's the mood there at the moment? How busy is it in terms of the economy and the and industry down at the docks with the whole grain corridor open again if you're able to sort of take us down into the streets where if we're able to visit now and after the war where should we visit even in the midst of the war now where's a where are we able to go a cafe an art gallery what are we able to do how are we able to spend our time in this wonderful city uh hi everyone uh thank you for giving me the opportunity to be the voice of ukrainians today and share my thoughts i moved to london when the full-scale war began but my family, brothers, cousins, and friends are still in Ukraine. Originally, I'm from Odessa, right? A poor city in the south that Putin is determined to occupy. Every day, Russian missiles and drones strike my city. Uh, people are sitting on bomb shelters, though with ballistic missiles from Crimea, there is often just a minute or two to react, to be honest. I travel back home periodically and experience this horror firsthand. In 10 days, I plan to return to Odessa. A few weeks ago, Russians killed my cousin, dropping a grenade from a drone. He was a policeman in Kherson. Evacuating civilians, uh, it's crucial for me to be with my family and visit his grave. I believe it's important to share this story so people don't forget about the war and continue supporting Ukraine. Uh, despite everything, our people continue to fight and continue to live. Uh, the Ukrainian Green Corridor, our ports uh, and ports continue to operate even under these challenging conditions. This response uh, showcases the determination of the Ukrainian people to keep the economy moving, even in the face of relentless adversity. I always invite the British to Odessa after the war because I know you love it. We have amazing sea, incredibly delicious food. Places like Tatarbunar, Dacha and Chernomorka are just a few examples. Our city also boasts on one of the most beautiful opera houses in Europe. And our theatres continue to offer vibrant performances. Odessa's rich cultural heritage, uh, stunning architecture and very cool people and warm hospitality make it a unique and unforgettable destination. Uh, despite the current challenges, the spirit and charm of Odessa remain strong and I hope you'll have the chance to experience it for yourself when the war is over. But what we need for this to stop the war, the message Ukrainians are trying to convey to the West, we need more weapons to continue defending our land, pushing back against Russian forces and protecting our civilians. Ukraine urgently requires more military support. This includes advanced 
weaponry that can help maintain our defenders and give us the upper hand on the battlefield. Permission to use long-range weapons in crucial. These systems are vital for targeting key military infrastructure in Russian occupied territories, disrupting supply lines and um, weakening their offensive um, capabilities. While Western countries are cautious about escalation for Ukraine, I understand uh, these weapons are essential not only for defense, but for reclaiming lost territories and securing a future uh, free from Russian aggression. Uh, in short, Ukraine is asking the West to maintain and increase military support, trusting in Ukraine's responsible use of these tools to defend our sovereignty. Mm, the quicker and stronger the support, the sooner we can restore peace and stability in the region. Could I ask you about the grain, how, that, how the industry has got back on its feet after the de facto blockade. It was never actually a legitimate blockade, as we discussed some time ago, what actually makes a blockade, a legal blockade. Um, but the de facto blockade is, is, now, is now gone. Russia cannot stop the grain corridor from operating again. How has that shifted activity in, in the city? Is, is there still great nervousness about that or is it back to some sort of new normal? Oh, it's very dangerous for the people who work there, but people continue to do it and the prices are very bad. Uh, you know, it's like the processes are super slowly, but um, we are still strong and we try, we continue. Uh, we need to support about, uh, like we need to protection, we need to protection our sky. And um, I think uh, we have a chance to continue uh, work in this field. Brilliant. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks for um, thanks for that update. I'd just like to say thank you to Todd in Wisconsin and George in Hampshire here in the here in Britain for your letters, actual physical letters that I can hold. Thank you for all the emails that are still coming in. I'm down to six hundred. I've just checked six hundred and seventy eight unread emails in my special David folder that I've created, and I'm trying to uh, uh, get round to every all of them. I will. Well, I will get round to all of them in due course, but I'm. I'm doing little by little, so I've still got quite a few to go. But thank you, Todd and George, for your for your letters. They were lovely, lovely words. Thank you so much. I will ensure David's family get to see them. And uh, yeah, George, you're right. He was a bearded wonder. With that in mind, with another bearded wonder in mind, Roland, what are your final thoughts, please? Thank you. Um, as, I, as I stroke my beard, my final beard stroking thought. Hmm. Carrying on from what I was just saying about this victory plan and timelines. I think I talked to you about timelines on my last final thought um, a few days ago. Look, the, winter is a is a timeline. There's clearly a big push to get to get money to Ukraine, to get Ukraine in a position to get through the winter. There is the, the the U.S. election, which is a factor looming. There is, of course, next week's very close horizon of the United Nations General Assembly in New York and what may emerge from that. But there's a there's a wider kind of discussion you 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 start to see amongst Ukraine watchers, and and the 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 nub of it is the nub of the hypothesis is that look, it is no longer enough to say as long as it takes because put bluntly that will mean ukraine bleeding out that there has to be a push to achieve a victory of some sort uh, rather than to allow this to go on indefinitely because letting it go on indefinitely means disaster and that the kind of concluding thought the the derived conclusion um of that sequence of thought is that that requires quite a significant shift in thinking amongst ukraine's allies and particularly of course in the United States. I don't have a, you know, an informed, reflective view of whether that hypothesis, that way of looking at things is, is flawed, accurate, one way or the other, but it's certainly something that um, I'm beginning to see, you know, see and hear being discussed. And I think it's definitely um, a question that deserves to be chewed upon and reflected upon in uh, the coming weeks. Thanks, Roland. Chew and reflect we will. Victoria, as as our guest today, would you like the very final thoughts today? Um, 
we're deeply grateful for the support to Britain and other partner countries. However, I want to remind that if Ukraine loses, the entire civilized world stands to lose. The next targets of Russian aggression could very well be Moldova or Poland. It's uh, crucial to consider the future. Ukrainians have already paid a high price. Supporting us now is not just about Ukraine. It's about global security and democratic values, I think. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph, created by David Knowles. To support our work and to stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it's released, do refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it helps others find the show. Please also share it with those who may not be aware we exist. As the disinformation war ramps up, we are relying on your support more than ever. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Phil Atkins. Executive producers are Louisa Wells and David Knowles.